Uh, since February 1st, uh, all across the nation, we're celebrating Black History Month. Uh, week one of February, I had mentioned that we were going to be doing a Black History Month spotlight every weekend. And this weekend, to stay in that thread, we're honoring the life of George Washington Carver. Come on, somebody. A little insight. He was a man of many talents, inventor, agricultural scientist, and as Time Magazine dubbed him in 1941, a genius in the vein of Leonardo da Vinci. But you can add another accolade to this man's life. People said that he was also a deep man of faith. Some of his creative focus was discovering, this is wild, a hundred plus uses for the sweet potato. Amen. And this is even more wild, 300 uses for the peanut. Now, I, instantly people are like, that's 299 more than I can think of because I just like to put that with some jelly. Amen. It's pretty amazing. Carver believed he could harbor a deep faith in both God and science. And he successfully integrated the two during his 79 years on earth. Faith was the biggest part of his life, though. He said, there isn't much to my story. God just came into my heart one afternoon while I was alone in a loft. It was a big barn while I was shelling corn to carry the mill to, a ground, to, to be ground into meal. He said, at 10 years old, a friend of mine came to me who was a white friend, and he invited me by another, and, and another friend to a Sunday school class where God got my attention I learned there how to pray and have a relationship with Jesus, and something changed that day when I climbed back up into the loft. Carver attributed his great discoveries and his successes not to science, but to God. He was a humble man who truly believed that all the greatness and all of his accomplishments were directly from the Creator. Come on, Hope City, can we honor the life and legacy of George Washington Carver today for Black History Month? Uh, I want to encourage you, take down notes today. I want to encourage you to, to, if you need an eyeliner, bump somebody say, I need that, I need to take down notes. Uh, take down notes, pull out your iPhones, your Droid devices, whatever you have. I want to encourage you. I believe there's a word for the house today, and we're going to pray and we're going to jump in. Let's pray. God, I thank you today that you give us ears to hear you, a mind that's sharp to understand, but most importantly, God, we need a heart ready to receive. We thank you today that our church has always been and will always be marked by miracles. So God, mark us with your presence today through your word in Jesus' name. If you believe it, somebody say amen. amen. I'm gonna give a shout out across all of our locations to Hope City Worship. Can we give it up for Hope City Worship? And I have a reason. Yes, they're talented and they have incredible abilities, but we are not building a church on abilities. Because we, we don't, we don't, we're not, we're, not, we're not building this thing on ability, we're building it on the anointing. We wanna give people Jesus, not goosebumps. But across all of our campuses, you can walk in. That's why I want to encourage you, show up early. Don't miss a worship moment. There, there is this almost misconception in Americanized Christianity that is like, well, worst case, if I'm late, we miss worship. Y'all, this is the place where you get surrendered before God. You can shake off some shackles and lay down some chains and get your heart prepared for what God has for you since day one. And we continue to build on this legacy we are putting Jesus at the center of it all. And when we put Jesus at the center, everything else comes into perspective. If you're taking down notes, the title of my sermon, and this is a big title. It's gonna be a lengthy title. It's God Places Purpose on the Imperfect. God Places Purpose on the Imperfect. The past eight weeks, we've all experienced every emotion, from brokenness to sorrow, but at the exact same time, if you don't know Jesus, this doesn't make sense, but at the exact same time, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit has overshadowed our church with peace and hope for the future. God places purpose on the, imperfect, on the imperfect, on the imperfections, on the things in our lives that maybe we haven't fully surrendered yet. And maybe this year started, and I don't know about you, but January was the longest, month, longest year of my life. I don't know if you all saw that one meme. It says, I don't know what day it is. It's January 73rd. Like it felt like, but the last eight weeks, maybe this year didn't kick off like you were wanting. Maybe you broke your New Year's resolutions day three. You're like, well, I already ate Chunky Monkey ice cream. I'll try again in 23. Like, I don't know. I don't know your story. But no, the truth is maybe there's been unexpected storms or shipwreck moments that have tried to catch you off guard. Because here's the truth. The enemy doesn't play fair. Now, we're a life-giving church. You're going to get humor, and you're going to get stories, but you're going to get the validity of the word. The enemy does not like you. Some of you are like, wow, he's coming in hot. No, this shirt is coming in hot. I'll tell you right now, <laughs> it is bold and yellow. But no, the truth is, 
The enemy doesn't like you. Why? Because he knows you're dangerous. He knows that if you'll realize that you have a purpose and a destiny and a call on your life, that's why we say all the time we want you to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose. The enemy knows if she'll discover her purpose, she'll recognize healing is in her hands. If he'll recognize who he is and he's actually recognizing with confidence and boldness whose he is, they'll be unstoppable. They'll be limitless. There'll be no lid on their lives. John 10, 10 says that the enemy wants to come steal, kill, and destroy. Again, because he knows you're dangerous. He knows that if you'll allow the Holy Spirit to fill you up and you'll get filled up with the word of God out of the overflow, there'll be the word of God on your lips. You, you, we were at a restaurant yesterday and I couldn't help but tell our waitress about Hope City. I couldn't help it. I, I, I was like, I gotta tell her because I saw purpose on her. I told my wife, I said, man, she, is, she exudes joy. And I just need to tell, I need to, not, not, I gotta tell her about Jesus, but I also need to tell her about Hope City. And so I told her, I said, hey, Jess, where do you go to church? She said, ooh, uh, uh, yeah, you know, about that. I uh, sort of juggling. I'm like, what's happening? No, she's like, I kind of have been uh, kind of church hopping a little bit. I haven't really found a place to land. And I said, well, I want you to know there's an incredible call of God on your life. We come to this restaurant all the time, but I believe today that just maybe you were connected to my destiny for today on the 19th of February to tell you that you're valuable, that your life is worth it, that there's an incredible plan. The enemy wants Jess and wants us to not figure it out because he knows if he can rob you of your confidence, steal your joy, muddy the waters of your faith, not only does he rip you off on who you're supposed to be, I say this all the time, he also rips off all the people connected to your purpose. You realize there's people connected to your purpose? There are people you can reach that I'll never have a sphere of influence in. Now you can invite them, they could sit in these seats, they could watch online. The truth is they'll read your life more than they'll ever read the Bible. And they'll see who you are and the confidence of whose you are. I feel like somebody should say amen. The second half of John 10.10, 10, because I know I came in heavy, the enemy doesn't like you, but the second half of John 10.10, 10, man, it's life-giving. It says that God, comes to give us life, and life more abundantly. So we're gonna unpack some things today that I believe are gonna help you through a story about the Apostle Paul's life, but Jesus himself reminded us that the facts are that we all go through some stuff. We all go through things. We all go through storms and trials and situations. The facts are the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Jesus himself in John 16, 33 said it this way, I've told you all of this that you may have peace this isn't peace that the world can give. This is a sustained peace. This is the peace that surpasses all understanding. This is the peace that when you're in the doctor office and they say, wow, you handled this bad news really well. And you say, yeah, because I have a promise. I have a promise that my God is gonna sustain me in every situation. I have a promise that the great physician is fighting for me, that he's already healing and going before me. Because here on earth, you'll have trials and sorrows of many kinds, but take heart. This is Jesus's words because I've overcome the world. He wants us to rely, depend, and wholeheartedly trust in him. I love what Proverbs chapter three, verse five and six says. We quote this a lot here because it is a foundation verse at Hope City, but I like the way the Amplified reads. It says, lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all of your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own insight or understanding, but in all your ways, say all my ways. Know, recognize, and acknowledge him, and he will direct and make straight and plan your paths. Here's the truth. You really don't know what kind of foundation you build upon until you go through something. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. We talk about it in Matthew 7 where it talks about the man. The storm shows up, the winds blow, the rain falls, but the house didn't fall. Why? Because he built it on the rock. But then the same storm shows up, and the foolish man built his house on the sand. The truth is you really don't know what kind of foundation your life has been built on until you go through something. I think that Hope City is a testimony of what this place has been built on because we've gone through some things and we're still standing. Come on, somebody. We're still standing. Look at the person next to you and say, I I I'm still standing. Come on, let them know. I'm still standing. Maybe some of you have hit rock bottom before. Maybe some of you right now are at rock bottom. I want to encourage you. When you hit the rock, I need you to be encouraged that you hit the rock of your salvation. You hit the author and the finisher of your faith. He can and will heal you. He's still just one mention of his name away. Have you ever had a flashback? I know I said this a few weeks ago, but it just hit me again yesterday. 
Have you ever had a flashback of all the things God showed up and healed you and delivered and restored you from that you just whisper, ooh, thank you, Jesus. Come on, where's all the never should have made it? Come on, where's all the people that have been through some things? And if you're breathing and you woke up again today, there will be moments that you have to go through. If you're taking down notes, you can write this down. It's another foundation of Hope City. God will never give you a life where he's not necessary. He'll never give you a life where he's not necessary. He wants us to trust, depend, and lean on him as the good, good father that he is. And so I said it a moment ago, this week we're gonna be looking at the life of the Apostle Paul. And, and as we kind of unpack this, it's truly a story of trusting God and audacious faith. And I believe that if you'll lean in and listen to the Holy Spirit, it will tie into your own life. I wanna look at how Paul's life and the situation and seasons he found himself in were completely out of his control. But in the journey, even though it was out of Paul's control, God continued to work it not only for Paul's good, but all the people connected to Paul's assignment and destiny. This is a fascinating story, but the truth is, Paul's gone through some stuff. If you're a student of the Bible, I encourage you to go back and read about Paul's life and read about the journey that he was on. He had quite a crazy journey, thrown into a dungeon, almost killed multiple times, arrested again, waited around in prison to go to Rome for around two years. Now, this is maybe just me speaking personally, but waiting on God's timing has been difficult for me throughout the years not always easy because in our humanity and in our human mindedness, we automatically assume when something's delayed, it must be denied. Where, where have you been? Like, that's the truth. Well, God, I don't know why you have decided to leave me, not answer any of my prayers. But the truth is, Paul remained faithful and obedient to God when everything else around him was falling apart. As I was studying about Paul's life for this this sermon, I started having thoughts like, I wonder what Paul must have felt. The truth is the Holy Spirit empowered him to trust God. God comforted Paul and told him that he would go to Rome to stand before Caesar to testify about Jesus. We say, we say this all the time, but I want you to hear this repetition. God's promises don't break when you lean on them. And when you lean on the promises of God, and God's promises don't have expiration dates. So as Paul's going through season after season and tough time after tough time, from the dungeon to the prison to almost killed to arrested to waiting around for two years, how did he, how did he stay steadfast? Because he had a word from the Lord that he was going to go to Rome. And he was going to at some point stand before Caesar. The great news is the same Holy Spirit that comforted Paul is the same Holy Spirit that will comfort you. That's where somebody should have shouted. I, I got some amens and I need it. No, no, it's the same Holy Spirit. I don't have greater access to the Holy Spirit than you do. Now, I've got clergy on my title, so I can do weddings like, and you say I do, kiss your bride, and I also can do celebration of life services. Some would say you can marry and you can bury. No, but here's the truth. I don't have access to the Holy Spirit even any more than you do. The same Holy Spirit that speaks to us is the same Holy Spirit that speaks to you. The same Holy Spirit that comforted Paul in the dungeon and in the prison that said, stay on mission, stay focused. You're going to Rome. You're gonna go testify before Caesar. Stay focused, stay on mission is the same Holy Spirit that will rest on us. Psalms 37, seven says, rest in the Lord. This is tough and wait patiently on him. How many of y'all deal with patient issues, like patience issues? You walk in, you're like, how long did you say the wait was? Seven minutes. I'm out. I'm not waiting for fajitas for no amount of time. No, but the truth is we deal with this. How many of you guys are like super kind? You're like, uh-huh. I get one well, not here. You can't be like this. It's on your ear. You're like, mm-hmm, okay. Bye. And you're like, let's go. And you're like road rage. We deal with patience issues here in Houston, Texas. Maybe where you're watching in some small town, you're like, we don't deal with that here. We deal with that here. How many of y'all deal with that? Some impatience issues. Psalms 37, seven, again, rest in the Lord and wait patiently on him. The tough, the, the, the tough thing that sometimes that we have to deal with and we have to wrestle in our humanity is that we're in and everything is quick. Instant gratification. Everything is having your way now. So if it's not DoorDash mentality and everything's not happening fast, God, I prayed. I even put some money in the offering. Where's my Escalade? It, it, the truth is we have an instant gratification. And here, let me say this. You can't microwave spiritual maturity. 
Other areas of your life can be microwave. You can't, mi- this is a daily routine of relationship where you just spend time in the presence of God. Jackie and I are gonna be celebrating in July 18 years of marriage. Thank you. Thank you for putting up with me. But what we didn't know 18 years ago, we've grown into 18 years later. But there are people that have gone before us that have been married 40, 50 years, and we don't know what it's like to be 40, 50 years yet. But the truth is we're gonna daily lean into the presence of God, listen to the Holy Spirit, and grow at a healthy pace. Paul was prison, wrongfully accused, but Paul had a revelation of Jesus as Emmanuel, which means God with us. Paul didn't run, I need somebody to hear this, he did not run from the place he was in, why? Because he knew God's presence was with him. Paul had all that he needed. Paul didn't run from the waiting or the tough seasons. He actually worked in the wait. I wanna give you two things that Paul did in the waiting season. He knew that God was always going to be with him. He knew that God would always be with him. Deuteronomy 31 says that he will never leave us or forsake us. Number two, he knew that he was always where he needed to be, even if it was a tough season. Some of y'all are in situations and seasons right now, and God's trying to grow you up in that season. But in our humanity, we can try to rush it. I've said this before, if you rush it, you'll ruin it. It's better to pause, pray, and be patient, because I don't want the waiting season to become a wasted season in my life. I wanna grow in this season so that I don't have to repeat it two, three, five years from now. Paul was working in the waiting season. Paul never ran away from the season or even tough seasons. The Bible doesn't clearly lay this out, but it does tell us enough about Paul's character, so I don't feel that this is a stretch. I feel pretty confident in this, that Paul wasn't, again, running from the waiting season, but he was diligent in the waiting season. Well, what does that look like? Jailers who once held keys to the prison were going home with keys to eternal life because of Paul's influence. There are people you work with, and because of your influence, can be set free. There are people that you have a sphere of influence in, again, from neighborhoods to nations, that God will use your life to get in the way of their storm. Romans chapter two, verse four says, the goodness and love of God is what draws a man's heart to a place of freedom. What if it's through your life? Not screen support and a microphone from a guy in a yellow shirt. What if it's from you? What if because Paul worked his weight, watch this, men behind bars now could become free in the spirit because of Paul's influence, because Paul decided not to retreat, decided to press in in the waiting season. And then in the next season, we're gonna read about this, waterlogged shipmates, people on this boat that Paul was with, wrongfully accused, didn't have to carry the heavy burden. Paul saw purpose, even in the prison moments. Paul didn't need the praise and validation of men because the anointing that was on him came from God. His mission wasn't about a Beamer or a Benz or even a corner office. Now, maybe God has blessed you with that. Paul knew what he was called to, to see blind eyes open. Paul knew what he was called to because he was going to stand before Caesar. He had a promise from God. Say, I have a promise from God. Come on, say it out loud. I need you to believe it. So we're going to be looking at Acts 27. It's time for Paul to travel to Rome. We're going to be reading through a lot of scripture. I said this a moment ago. There's going to be fun moments and stories But we are a Bible foundation, spirit-filled, life-giving church, and we're gonna go through the Bible, not opinion, okay? Just let's just clear that up. It's not my opinion. We're gonna go to the word in Acts 27. Paul is shipped off with 276 other men, and they were planning to sail to various ports along the seacoast. And in Acts 27, verse 13, a massive storm with hurricane force winds called the Northeaster begins to blow through the region. And it starts to wreak havoc on the islands around, but the, the, the ship that Paul was specifically on could not withstand the chaos of the storm, and it began to rip apart. It's a bad situation. I think we can all agree that Paul's in a bad spot. And I wanna encourage you, if you're a student of the Bible, go back, starting at verse 13 of Acts 27, and begin to read through this. But we're gonna go to verse 41 as our focus of attention today for the sake of time. Acts 27, 41 will be on the screens, but the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move. The stern was broken to pieces. Somebody say pieces. By the pounding of the surf. Verse 42. The soldiers, this gets bad, like this turns pretty quickly. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. Verse 43, it says, but, 
I need everybody, right? You can capitalize that, but God. Because the truth is, something shifts here in the direction of favor, not only to Paul's life, but to everyone connected to Paul, but the centurion. Man, thank God for this guy. He wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. I can't back this theologically, but I believe that of all these prisoners, the other 276 dudes that are on this boat, the centurion was moved with compassion because there was something different about Paul's life. I pray this prayer every single time that I get on a plane to fly out. When we're walking down the jet bridge, I say, God, I thank you that just like the 276 men were on the boat with Paul, because God, you were with Paul, everyone's life was spared that day. Because you're with me, the, the pilots to the flight attendants and everybody on that plane is going to be safe and we're going to get to where we're going because you have given me a promise that I would reach the nations and reach people for Jesus. So just like you were with Paul, you were with me. Now, have I had some turbulent moments? Absolutely. Have mass drop before and I'm like, like uh, yes. But do I trust God in the process that he's faithful to complete the work that he started? Yeah. Absolutely says that the soldiers plan to kill, but the centurion, verse 43, wanted to spare Paul's life. He ordered those who could swim, this is massive, to jump overboard first and get to land. Verse 44, the rest were to get there on planks or other pieces, say pieces. And in this way, everyone, how many? Everyone reached land safely. Paul found purpose in the pieces. He didn't kick against the tide he actually said in Acts 27, 31, unless the men stay with the ship that cannot be saved, if you're taking down notes, write this down. If you'll hold on in the breaking, God will bring you to the shores of your purpose. Yeah. If you will hold on in the breaking, God will get you to the shores of your purpose. God will place purpose on the imperfect seasons. I think we can all learn a lot in this moment from Paul's life because again, this entire situation was out of his control. He couldn't fix any of this in his own strength, yet he relied and depended fully on the strength of God. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul's words, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. God's hand was still fully resting on him and all the men that were connected to Paul's destiny. Not only was his presence resting on Paul, like, hey, I don't know what you guys are gonna do. No, 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 it was also protecting everyone connected to Paul's purpose. A skeptic would say, well, where was God in all this? Where was God in the prison? Where was God on the ship? Where was God in the middle of the storm? And if you look at it closed-minded and you look at it, there's some valid points if you look at it from that perspective because the storm and the shipwreck should have killed him. But the truth is, if you're looking through this, I can run parallel with this. Because the truth is, some of you today, watching online in all of our locations, you know that there's things you've walked through that you never should have made it in. Come on, where's all my never should have made it at? And the skeptic says, well, where was God in it? It might have been an 11th hour moment, and God might have delivered you from the fire. Maybe he pulled you out of the fire. But the truth is, did he show up? Come on, have you survived 100% of your worst days already? Did you wake up again today and you're breathing? So Paul had a revelation of this. He had a revelation. Maybe some situations that you're dealing with are your own choices. Maybe someone has hurt you and it was at the hands of someone else that you've been hurt. But I believe today God wants to get to us. Uh, there's some things that can be taught. Other things have to be caught. And I believe God is proving something today as we listen. If you're taking down notes, God will still get you to your destination on broken pieces. No matter where you've been, no matter what it feels like around you, God will still get you to your destination, ultimately on broken pieces. And in this moment, maybe some of you today, you're like, here's the truth. I'm still holding on to those pieces. Maybe you floated into Hope City at one of our locations on those broken pieces. Maybe you tuned in today online. Maybe you're watching an archive of this message and you're like, Daniel, I'm still holding on to this piece because this piece feels safe. At some point today, I believe you're gonna trade in the broken pieces for the peace of God. And I believe he's, a, he's gonna shift some things in your life. So as the story continues in Paul's journey, this is amazing, Acts 28, Paul arrives to the island called Malta. Malta is in the central Mediterranean between Sicily and the North African coast. We have a picture of 
Malta. It looks like a beautiful, exotic destination, but when a ship is ripped apart by a hurricane-forced uh, winds uh, called the Northeaster, uh, they probably only got glimpses of this amazing-looking island from the flickering of lightning. And so the prisoners are fleeing. They're holding on to planks, and they're holding on to pieces, and they ultimately end up at this island called Malta. We're going to look in Acts 20. 8, verse 1 through 10. I just love this story. Watch, watch. It says, once safely on shore, we find out that the island was called Malta. Okay, great. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. That's good news. They could have been cannibals, right? This could have been really bad. Like, they didn't know what they were walking into. They got detoured to a situation that was not a part of the assignment. I feel the Holy Spirit on that. Some of you, the wind in life has detoured you, but God can still work it for your good. And God, watch, and this is what happens. God shifts it. So watch this. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. That's great. So they built a fire, welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul, though, he he's a, has a servant's heart. He gathers up brushwood, and he puts it on the fire. This is where it gets crazy. A viper. A snake, y'all. How many of y'all hate snakes? Come on, I want to see. Amen. How many of y'all are like, oh, snakes are okay? Okay, well, no. All right, true story. We're going to come back to this. Um, we had a neighbor that was out of town, and a friend of mine called me and said, hey, um, there's a huge snake trying to get into the house, and my wife is there, and uh, can, like, can you? I said, why, why are you calling me? <laughs> like, I'm like, does he, does, does he know who he called? And he's like, well, you, you look like a guy that handles snakes. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> what is, is it the Paul Bunyan looking Sasquatch looking vibe with the, I don't know. I'm like, uh, okay, uh, you're profiling me fully. Okay, so he goes, no, I just need you to go over there and just handle the snake. I'm like, okay. So I go over, like, I see that, y'all, this is a huge snake, and this thing potentially was the one that tricked Eve. It was demon possessed. <laughs> it was creeping all up on the door. I think it was trying to grab the door handle. It got super weird. And I'm YouTube video, I'm like, how do you? So I try to come up behind the snake and grab it by the back of the head. Who does that? <laughs> Unless y'all are real, like, like you're the snake whisperer. I am not. So just, let's go ahead and just confirm that now. I, I tried to get its attention. It was like, and I was like, uh. And then I tried to grab it from the back of the head. The thing whipped around and tried to bite me. I'm like, uh-uh. And I had a shovel and I was like, bong. And I kept missing it. It's a true story. It ended up running really quickly to the edge of their house. And they have like this siding with this little plastic corner piece. The thing got up there and started climbing up in the house. I tried to grab its tail, true story, and pull it out. I couldn't. I was like, that thing's not moving. So I ended up going to the door. And I was like, hey, that snake might be in your house. The snake might be in the house. We're going to have to get you a hotel. And she was like, what are you talking about? I was like, I don't know. You're going to want to get out of the house. Like, I think it's just going to creep down. In the... That's a true story. So well, let's go back to the Bible now. Okay. So this viper, driven out by the heat, bites Paul's hand. Verse 4, when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand. Y'all, if you are not students of the Bible, you're missing out on the greatest adventures. This is phenomenal. They said, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul, in all his boldness, why? Because he had a promise from God, shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people, verse six, expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. They're like, he's dying. He's not dying yet. He's not breathing. No, the smoke got him. He got bronchitis. Uh, no, no, they're watching him and nothing happens after... A long waiting period. They changed their minds and they said he must be a God. Paul continued to hold on to the promise of God and he could not be shaken in the midst of the chaos because he knew God was the author and the finisher of his faith. Paul wasn't afraid of the snake again because he knew he was called to stand before Caesar. Paul wasn't afraid of the island or the villagers because he knew he was gonna stand before Caesar. Paul didn't set up camp at Chateau El Malta, the resort, because he knew he would stand before Caesar. This was not his final destination. See, when you've learned to lean in and hear from the word of God, you'll navigate your season with joy and with peace, and anxiety will seem to just lift. The absence of fear will just begin to happen in your life. Because God has spoken promises over you, listen, that your season needs to hear. God has spoken promises over you. He's written victory in your story that your current, past, and future season needs to hear. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Pueblos, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us into his home, showed us generous hospitality for three days. This is getting better and better. 
but his father was sick in bed, suffering from a fever. Paul went in to see him and prayed, and he was healed. Again, this has nothing to do with Paul, but there is healing in our hands from God to us and through us. That's why we should walk in more boldness. When somebody says, oh, I'm dealing with a wicked, bad migraine, you're like, oh, I'm glad it's not me. <laughs> They're like, can I pray for you? We were at City Center last night outside of Jenny's ice cream. Come on, somebody. Nobody? If you haven't tried it, it's amazing. And there was a gentleman who said, hey, uh, Pastor, go to Hope City. I haven't been in a while. He started telling me about his wife. And I could have said, oh, it's too bad. He said, yeah, my wife's been dealing with this, this health challenge. I said, okay, oh, it's too bad. Hey, we're trying to eat ice cream with our friends. <laughs> no, instead, I said, what's her name? And right there in front of anybody and everyone, I didn't care. I said, we're going to pray right now at City Center outside of Jenny's Ice Cream and their premium $9 a scoop ice cream. Amen. <laughs> there must be manna and anointing all up, whipped up in it. I said, let's pray for her right now. And him and I agreed with his family for complete and total healing so that she can walk back in these doors again. Can you hook up with your, can you hook your faith up that we believe that there's still healing in our hands? Because this man was healed. In verse nine, when this happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and they were all cured. The dungeon and the prison should have killed him. The storm should have killed him. The shipwreck should have killed him. The snake in the island should have killed him. But God in this massive detour turned it, into, turned it ultimately for God's good and ultimately for all the people connected to, to Paul's life. Write this down if you're taking down notes. God will pull purpose. This is going to be huge for somebody. God will still pull purpose out of you where the enemy has tried to stop you. God will pull purpose out of you where the enemy has tried to stop you. The very area, this is my prayer, the very area this year, 2022, that hell has been trying to keep you from occupying, God is about to shift things and move in your favor. And I believe this year in your family, we're gonna take some territory, not only as a church, but as individuals. Come on, look at the person next to you and say, get a good look at me. Come on, get a good look at me because you're not gonna recognize me one week from now. Come on, look at your second choice and say, get a good look at me, because one year from now, I'm going to look like a different person. God will pull purpose out of you where the enemy has tried to stop you. One day, you will tell your story about how you overcame everything that you went through, and it will be someone else's survival guide. Someone else will see that God showed up and fought for you, and if he did it for you, we believe he can do it for anyone. I believe in 2020, 2021, and 2022, we've been saying this, but I have audacious faith to believe that hell can't stop what heaven has started in us, not only as a church, but as individuals. I believe that for my family and everything that the enemy has tried to muddy the waters of our faith, hell can't stop what heaven has released and started in us. If you believe that, say amen. Come on. Jackie and I have walked through some shipwreck moments. We've walked through situations. She had a miscarriage between... Daphne and our little buddy Fox. But in the midst of that miscarriage, there was a side effect. Some of you know the story. We had to do emergency surgery. We didn't. The doctors did. This wasn't at a tanning salon. This was at a real hospital. No, we were in the middle of a situation that was tough. And God ended up doing a miracle, which ultimately saved her life. And we realized in that moment that God continued in every situation and storm he didn't cause the pieces or the planks, but he used them to get us to a safe place. Why? Because God will bring his peace to you in the midst of the pieces. God will bring purpose to you in the midst of the pieces. God will position you through the pieces. God will place himself near to you among the pieces. And in the midst of the tough seasons and the seasons that we've walked through, in the midst of them doing emergency surgery to save her life, I was holding on to pieces called Proverbs. I was holding on to some pieces called the Psalms. I was holding on to some pieces out of the Gospels. I was holding on to some pieces out of Isaiah 58, 8, that I was confident that God was healing and restoring. And whether it was at the hands of a physician or the almighty great physician, heaven was about to touch earth and there would be a providence moment moment, and I was holding on to those pieces. Some of you, again, today, you've been holding on to broken pieces. My challenge to you as a church today is I want you to choose to press on. Come on, somebody say out loud, press on. Because again, it's important to note, I said this a moment ago, that God did not cause the broken pieces, but he will use them to rescue us. Today, I want to encourage you, with every eye closed just for a moment, to let go of some of those broken pieces some of those planks, 
And I want you to physically, if you want to lift your hands towards heaven and release it and trade it in for a different peace, Philippians chapter five, verse seven says, in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will ultimately guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. For Jackie and I, after time after time, storm after storm, we have daily chosen to continue to press on, to move forward to what God is asking us, whether it was a miscarriage or the devastation of almost losing my wife. People said to us, are you guys really gonna try to have another baby? Aren't you scared that this could happen all over again? Jackie and I decided in that moment, you can look at me, to not allow fear to take root because fear tolerated is faith contaminated. It will muddy the waters of your ability to believe. But Paul said this in Philippians chapter three to the early church in verse 12, not that I have arrived or have attained all of this. I haven't arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold, which Christ Jesus took hold for me. When Paul describes pressing on, he was motivated and dedicated to following and pursuing God's plan for his life. The word press literally means to flee after. It's the image of a long distance runner pressing on, finding their stride, their rhythm. He consistently moved forward. He consistently ran after Christ with passion, and desperation, because it was real to him. Like Paul, we need to press on. We need to get to a place where we're surrendered, withholding nothing, laying down heaviness, making adjustments in our lives that lead to radical change. We need to press on. We need to know that we're in God's hands. We are the image of Jesus. We have a divine purpose on our lives. The Lord himself in Exodus 14, 14 is fighting for us. We need to choose to press on. We need to recognize that we may be facing financial crisis situations or a bleak situation. We need to trust that he is our provider and press on. Maybe you're dealing with distress. Maybe you're full of anxiety, insecurities. Maybe oppression and depression has tried to rob you of your best days. You need to choose to press on. I wanna encourage you, whatever crisis you're in, whatever family dynamic, broken situation you may be in, whatever broken heart situation you're in, I wanna challenge you today to press on. Maybe you're dealing with a physical ailment. Maybe the doctors haven't given you much hope. Maybe the diagnosis seems heavy. I want, to I want you to choose today to lean into the presence of God and choose to press on. Maybe in this season, even kicking off this new year, you've been dealing with temptation again. Maybe the enemy has tried to get you to fall back into the traps that you once got set free from. I wanna challenge you today as a church to choose to press on. Maybe you feel like damaged goods, when I said that earlier, or undervalued or overlooked or fragile. The Bible says in Psalms 139 verse 14 that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Know who you are and whose you are. I wanna challenge you today to press on. Maybe this weekend you're dealing with addiction and you say, Daniel, the truth is I have been bound by this struggle for years. I feel hopeless you to choose to lean into the one that can restore you, the one that can truly heal you today. I want to challenge you to press on. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will have the strength to press on. Somebody give God praise and say, press on. Come on. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I talked about joining a group. Last week, I talked about going through the growth track, getting on the team, digging your heels down deep, being a part of the huddle. The truth is your roots are significant. Deep roots do produce healthy fruit, but I want to say something that's kind of sobering because this is about daily relationship with Jesus. You will never rise in faith above your renewed mind. You can never rise in faith above the renewed mind of Christ building purpose in you. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will. My wife, Jackie, and I, again, 18 years ago, decided that when we go through things, much like Paul's story, areas and situations and things that we've had to fight and deal with, we decided in that moment, the day we got married, that if we were gonna go through something, then we were gonna choose to grow through it. Because the real flex is how many wounds you can turn into wisdom. The real flex is how many wounds that you've walked through that you can turn into wisdom and shout from the rooftops, this is my testimony story, how I went from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. 
how God made a night and day difference in me. Because even though we are all gonna walk through, and maybe you're currently walking through a situation, tough times don't last, tough people do. The Bible says in Job 17, nine, the righteous keep moving forward. Come on, somebody say, I'm the righteous. Come on. The righteous keep moving forward, and those with clean hands become stronger and stronger. You can stand your feet. God will never again give you a life where he's not necessary. God will get you to your destination on broken pieces, and God will pull purpose out of you where the enemy has tried to stop you. Will you lift your hands here, Cinco Woodlands, if you're watching online here at West Houston. God, today I pray that you would begin to stir in us a heart of surrender. But God, I pray that whoever that was for, we had some conversations in the lobby before the 1030 service today of people that feel like that they got to Hope City or maybe a situation on broken pieces. God, I thank you today for the reminder that you can still get us to our destination, unlock purpose in us on broken pieces, detour moments. You can still work it to our good and the people connected to our purpose. God, today with our hands lifted and a sign of surrender, I thank you that you place healing in our hands today that you would begin to stir a revival fire in us today, that you would begin to stir in us a hope today that life is not hopeless. Unlock joy today. Unlock peace today. Replace sorrow with hope. Replace brokenness with peace. Place restless hearts with joy. And God, today I thank you for a fresh wind behind every sail of every person. And I thank you today that just like Paul worked his weight, we will not dismiss the waiting season, but we will work in the waiting in Jesus' name. Come on, can somebody give God praise? Now come on, praise him because he's good. Praise him because he's faithful. All right, we're done, but I wanna give somebody an opportunity. The reason we do all of this, so if you'll just stay where you're at for just a moment. Actually, if you'll be seated, that'll be easier because I'll be able to see everybody. The reason why we do all of this week in and week out is because people matter to God, so they matter to us. The reason why we bring scriptures and worship shows up and our team sets up and does what they do is because there are people that need a savior and his name is Jesus. With every eye closed here, Cinco Woodlands watching online. If you're here today and you said, Daniel, wow, the truth is I floated here today on broken pieces, but I realized that God wants to heal my entire life I wanna surrender my life to Jesus for the first time. Or maybe you're here and you say, the truth is, Daniel, I fell away. I haven't been living for Jesus like I used to. I got caught up in the prodigal life, but today's my day that I wanna rededicate my life. Today's the day that I wanna stop living for me and I wanna start leaning back into his promises. I want God to pull purpose out of my life where the enemy has tried to stop me. And the truth is, I have been trying to do it on my own, in my own strength, but today's the day that I wanna surrender everything. I'm gonna count to three. We will not embarrass you, but you do have a next step. And in just a moment, we're gonna talk to you about that. But if you're here and you say, one, Daniel, I wanna give my life to God. Today's my day to surrender to Jesus for the first time. Two, today's my day. I wanna rededicate my life. When I hit three, I want you with boldness to lift up your hand across all of our locations. If you're watching online, just say yes to Jesus. Our team, our moderators will help you. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. I see your hand, 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 hand hand. I see you all over here. I see you. I see you waving at me in the back. I see you back there. Thank you. All the way over there. I see you over here. I see all these hands. Come on, somebody. I see you right here, my friend. You can put your hands down. Will everybody pray this prayer with me? Say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it hasn't worked. From today on, I choose to live for you. I lay every mistake, every struggle, every sin issue at your feet, and I ask for forgiveness. From this day on, I choose to live for you because you are my Father, you are my Savior, and you are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, let's make some noise.